So I thought we'd do a sort of rather long video on a short topic in that we'd have a look at compression. Um, we've done some videos in the past. Dave Brailsford's done some on bits of it, Huffman encoding, Elsa W. Mike's done some on JPEG. But I thought we'd just do a sort of general overview about compression. Well, okay, the, the best place to start is to actually think about what we're trying to solve. Think about the problem we're trying to solve. We're going to start off with some data and I shall represent this over here with a file. So we've got some data and we're wanting to send it so we've got a copy of the data or storing a copy of the data somewhere else. So we want, we've got the data here and we want to send it somewhere else. Let's talk about sending it. We may just be storing it on a disk so it takes up less space but we'll talk about sending it just to keep it simple. And what we want to do when we're compressing it is take it and we're going to run it through a black box which we'll call the compressor and I'm just going to write compress because I've drawn the box too small and compressor wouldn't fit in. Um, and that's going to give us a series of bits, ones and zeros, that represent that data. And the aim is that the number of bits here is less than the number of bits that we started with. So that this is going to be smaller than this. And then we can take that through a decompressor. And for orthogonality, I shall write decompress here. And then that will convert it back into the original data. So that's what we're aiming to do with compression. We're trying to take some data and represent it as a smaller amount of data, less bits. Now immediately there's two things that will strike from that. One, we're not going to be able to represent every file here in less bits. We can prove that mathematically. If, if, this, if we had eight bits here representing this data, that means there's two to the eight possible combinations, 256. If we're going to store it in less bits, that means this must be seven bits. I'm just going to say this, but is it fewer bits? Your name is not Dave Brailsford. <laughs> just check it. <laughs> yeah, it should be I, fewer. I don't actually know. So we've got two to the eight combinations here. That means there's 256 possible things here. If this is in fewer or less bits, then we must have seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, or potentially zero, but then we won't be able to distinguish it, so we can cross that one out. Bits here. This is 256, this is going to be 128, 128, this will be 64, that's 192, that'll be 32, that's 224, that's 16, that's 240. I hope you're checking my maths because that's now 248. So if we add all them up, we end up with actually, if we're using fewer bits, then there's only 254 possible things that we can uh, represent using fewer bits. So we can prove that we're not going to be able to compress everything down to being something smaller. There's going to be some things which will compress to things that are being bigger, at which point it's not worth compressing it, so we can ignore that. What we're aiming to do is design a system where most of the data we actually care about will become smaller, because there are some things, for example, if we're compressing a text file, we could probably generate the text file that would compress to be bigger, so it gets expands rather than compresses when we run it through the compression algorithm, but it would probably be a pathological case that wouldn't actually represent any real text. So we wouldn't probably be worried about it. But you cannot generate a compression algorithm that, compress, that can compress everything. It's just not possible, and we can prove that very easily as we just did. Actually, you can define randomness as being an uncompressible string. Um, so that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is if we're going to be compressing things, we're going to be taking information out. And so that means that there needs to be some redundancy in the original data. There needs to be something in there that we can throw away without losing the information that's in there. We can throw something away here when we represent it in the compressed stream, and then we can recreate it here. So there's something in here which is represented that actually we can represent in a different way and still rec recreate it. The other interesting thing is that often when you look at compression algorithms, so if you look at something like MPEG or H.264, they will define this part of it. They'll define the bitstream and they'll define the decompressor. They're not interested in how the compressor works because you can change, and this is particularly important for lossy um, compression things, we can class compressors into two types, lossless compressors. The bits we put in are the bits we get out one for one, zero for zero. Everything we put in, we get out in exactly the same order. With a lossy compression algorithm, we get something that's similar, but it's not necessarily identical. Um, think of it like a photocopier. You put something on a photocopier, you photocopy it, it looks identical, but you might get the odd bit of noise that's slightly different. Exactly the same thing 
we can get the meaning across, we can get the information across, but we don't get exactly the same bits. And that's fine for certain things, images, video, sound, but for other things, computer code, we definitely want to compress it so we get exactly the same bits across. So you have to decide, are you doing a lossy one or a lossless one? We'll concentrate on lossless mainly um, today. We'll talk a bit about lossy, but generally if you're doing lossy, you're making decisions which throw more information away that you can't recreate, but actually wasn't describing something in the original data that was that important. Uh, an example of that, background behind me is nicely out of focus. It's still moving around because the walls in computer science do that. Sean's actually on a tripod, but it's all the walls and background that are waving around in this place. But it's nicely out of focus. So actually there's less information there. And if we throw some of it away, it's, it's redundant. It's not actually encoding anything because it's already blurred and we wouldn't miss it or we regenerate the original thing. In most cases, if you're really editing this and you're sort of producing things and you're going to be processing it a lot, then the errors that are introduced with loss lead compression can build up and you perhaps want to not do that and keep the data. But certainly for transmitting it over YouTube, then we can let it sort of be similar, but not exactly the same. You won't notice it because you're looking at me rather than the background, which is really, really odd. I'd be looking at the background and not at me, but then each to their own. So what we're trying to do is take the data, let's go back to what we're talking about, um, and compress it down to a smaller number of bits. And as we said, we could perhaps think about this, these compressed bits as being instructions for the decompressor on how to recreate the data that we've got. So how do we go about doing this? Well, one thing that helps to think about this is actually to break it down into two stages. Let's get rid of that. Um, that's, that's loss of compression. Let's throw it away and it's gone. When we think about data, we're actually thinking about two things. We have a model for that data, how we describe it, and we also have an encoding for that data. How do we encode that into bits? Now let's think about that in an easy way. Let's think about some text. So I've got um, banana grams here, which Sean has helpully brought in. Um, other text-based games are available. Sorry. London 2012 edition. Which I think we got cheap because it was after 2012. Yeah, there's one on the floor here. Um, we've got an S. Um, we've got a blank. There we are, space. Um, there we are. We've got any others. Let's see if we can find. There we are. Um, any Star Trek fans in the room will recognize that uh, immediately. Um, so that's our model that we're going to represent the text as a series of characters and then they will represent them one after the other in the way that we'd write the words. Okay, so that's our model. Series of characters, one after the other. If we wanted a blank, we could pop that. Afterwards, we'd have that, and then we could perhaps have another word that follows it. Um, there we are. S-U-N. Go for the name of a computer. Um, there we are, and so on. So that's how we'd write that. Trill space sun we'd build that up and we could build everything up afterwards. So that's our model for the data. We've got a series of characters and they're represented one follows another to build up the data. Now, we could then represent that with an encoding and the classic one that you use here is ASCII or UTF-8 or Unicode to do that. And with that, you take each character, and we'll use ASCII and we'll represent them with a number. So the T, that will become 84. The R will become 82, if I can count backwards. I, I've got the ASCII set up on the computer. So we can represent that as a series of 8-bit numbers. And then we can convert them into binary, they'd be 8 bits. So we've got how many characters? We've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. 9 times 8, that's 72 different um, numbers. So we've got 72 bits. So this would take up 72 bits. There we are. But how can we compress it? Well, if you go watch the video that Dave did on Huffman encoding or LZW encoding, you could take into account the fact that some of these letters are more likely to occur in English than others. So what we can do is use the fact that these letters occur in the English text at different frequencies. So T is the second most common letter to occur in English text, E being the most common. So we can say, well, actually, because this is going to be more common, rather than using eight bits to represent it, we'll use two or three bits, and um, because you, I think, no, because, which one was it? Um, yeah, because you in this is gonna be the least common, we might use eight bits or maybe even nine or 10 bits to represent that. 
the model's the same, but we've changed the encoding, and we would use less bits to do that. So that's what I'm aiming to do. By encoding the ones that occur more frequently with less bits, and the ones that occur less frequency with more bits, even though we perhaps take up more bits to represent than we would on their own, we take up less space overall, so the file gets smaller. But we do trade something off, because the encoding we have here is nice for programs to work with. We know each character is going to be one byte long. If it's ASCII, if you get to UTF-8, it's not quite the same. But on ASCII, it's one byte long, so each character we can sort of skip ahead to the next one or to the third one very easily. As soon as we start spinning up to variable length with different numbers of bits, we have to process it in order, and effectively what you're going to do is convert it back to the normal encoding, to ASCII encoding, so that we can use it. So we can change the encoding to make the file smaller, but that's not the only thing we can do. We can also change the model we use to describe the data. And we talked about that briefly earlier when we talked about how the background is out of focus here. And that's how JPEG worked, which Mike's done a video, in that rather than representing the image as a series of pixels, we represent the image as the frequencies that make up those series of pixels. And because if you do that and you read it out in the right order, and watch Mike's video on that, you actually find that most images which are sort of like this, there'll be some areas, bits of my face and the hair in, where you are using lots of high frequency data to represent the hair uh, and so on. But the background, which is all blurred because Sean's got a nice depth of field on his camera, is blurred, so there's no high frequency content. So by switching it from just the amplitude of each pixel, which is what we'd normally use, into the frequency domain, we can throw away data in the background because it's not actually there and store the data in the foreground where it is actually there and we end up with a smaller file. Now on the way to that, the model we would use here to represent that file is actually gets bigger. So when we move from the sort of pixel domain that we're used to to the frequency domain, we end up having to use 10, 12 bits, 16 bits to represent those frequencies. But then when we compress it, encode it using an encoding system, we end up with something that ends up smaller. So we sort of change the model, which may be counterintuitive and make things slightly bigger for a bit, but it means that the way we're representing the data means it's easier to not have to encode that redundancy we talked about earlier. And so when you're designing a compression algorithm, you both need to think about, well, how am I going to encode the bits, but also how am I going to model the data? And that even applies for something as simple as text. One of the easiest ways that you can gain some compression, and we can see this, is if we had a, a sequence of characters that looked a bit like this, people probably guessed exactly where we're going with this already. So if we had a string like this, A, 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 E, 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 pathological example, then one of the easiest ways we can press this is actually to say, well, actually, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six A's, a followed by one, two, three, four, five, E. Rather than taking up 11 characters, we now only take up four, or four bytes. Um, you probably want to represent it slightly different, but if we change the model and to actually say, that's the time, we're going to describe it not as A, 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 but we're going to describe the number of letters we've got. In this case, we've got six A's followed by five E's. It takes up less space, and then we can encode that. Is this a model change? Is it an encoding change? Interesting question. It can get blurred which one you're actually doing at. So we'll ignore that for now. The problem with this, of course, if you've got something like Trill Sun that we had before, you end up with it's 1T, 1R, 1I, 2L, 1 space, 1S, 1U, 1N. It gets massively bigger. This sort of encoding, what's commonly referred to as run length encoding, this sort of way of describing data, works when you've got nice long runs. It works brilliantly for sort of images where you've got pixels that are all the same. Something like PNG you can use this quite well. But for something like text where things change every character pretty much, it doesn't work that well. Um, but there are ways you can get around it. So perhaps one way you could vary this is say, well actually, you can exploit the fact that if you know how the decompressor works and you describe and you define the compressor and the decompressor to work in similar ways, you could, for example, say, well, what I'll do is I will say, if I've seen three A's, the next symbol that comes along tells me how many more there are. So in this case, I would send it as A, 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 one, two, three, and then there's three more. And then I'll send it as E, 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 and two more. 
So we've now got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, which is better than the 11 we had before. But for something like Trill Sun, that would actually still get sent as nine characters. And we don't need to actually send any information because we've defined the decompressor and the compressor to work in the same way. Of course, if we end up with um, AAA, EEE, -E, AAA, EEE, -E, then what you end up with is it being encoded as AAA0, EEE0, -E AAA0, which is now, instead of it being nine characters, it would end up as 12 characters, so it's got bigger again. So there's always oh, oh, swings and roundabouts with this thing. And how much room it's got left. So now the sender knows, if I don't want to overwhelm that computer, I'm only going to send... It got slightly dimmer when we got to this row, and then slightly brighter again when we got to this row. And we might find that, but basically, if you've got a...